We're joined now by senior producer from NFL Films, also co-host of ESPN's NFL Matchup Show. It is one Greg Cosell joining us, and Greg, thanks for doing so. And we want to begin right off the bat with probably the most interesting part of this game, which is the fact that you have a rookie making his first career road start in quarterback Davis Mills, who, in at least what I've seen of him, looks pretty poised for a wet-behind-the-ears rookie. Especially, Chris, a rookie who started 11 games in his college career. Right. And I think, you know, it's funny because I, I, I did not watch all 11, but I watched all five of his games his last year at Stanford and it's Stanford, seen a few yeah. prior to that. Um, but he was a big-time recruit coming out of the Atlanta area. He clearly looks the part of a, of a pocket quarterback. He's not immobile. He has functional mobility. But for the most part, he's a pocket player. And he shows a very good feel for the timing and rhythm in the pass game. And he's got a good arm. I wouldn't call it a gun, but he has a good arm. Uh, and, you know, I think he looked reasonably comfortable when he started that Thursday night game a week ago against Carolina. I, I never got the sense that he was playing fast, that he was hurried or frenetic. He seemed pretty much in control. Was there a play or maybe an offensive possession for the Texans against the Panthers that you thought, wow, he is playing better than a rookie quarterback with one start under his belt right now? I would say, Maddie, there were two plays that stood out to me to show a sense of progression reading with good vision, which you like to see, obviously. Uh, He had Cooks for 30 yards in the first quarter after he looked left and came back to Cooks to the right on a deeper throw. And then even the one-yard touchdown to Anthony Miller, uh, he was not the number one read on that play. And down there in in the red zone like that, in a very condensed area, things happen quick. And he came off as number one and went to Miller really quickly. So those two plays, Maddie, really stood out to me. Yeah, I actually remember that second play because they brought, uh, I think it was the back came across in motion, and three of the defenders took the back, which left, you know, Miller all by himself. And he, I mean, he read that in the snap of a finger, like you said, Greg. It was impressive. What can we, and we saw David Culley, I don't know if you saw, Greg, he said this week that they are going to put more on his plate this week with respect to game plan. You understand why they didn't. His last two outings, I mean, he got 10 minutes notice at halftime in Cleveland that Tyrod was hurt and was not coming back. You're in for the second half. Go get him. And then after that, he prepared on a short week to play Thursday night, so they kept the game plan very vanilla. Now he's got 10 days of preparation. What do you think is reasonable to expect when you hear David Culley say, well, we're going to put more on his plate? Well, you know, none of us know what that means other than yeah. the fact that they'll go a little deeper into their playbook as far as passing game concepts. That's what they'll do. They'll they'll ask him to be able to handle some more things that are in the playbook. Um, normally with young quarterbacks, you try to keep the routes fairly basic, routes that everybody has. They're basic routes, you know, things like slant flat. They're, they're, they're basic reads. Um but so now you maybe give him a few more concepts. Maybe you add in more uh, formations. Uh, so in other words, you might run the same concepts, but you add in running those concepts out of uh, more formations, multiple formation looks, because he has to be aware of all that because he's calling the plays. So he has to know where people line up. So uh, maybe maybe they'll put some more motion in, you know, things of that nature that just add to his responsibilities and what he needs to understand. I mean, with what he needs to understand and what they're putting on his plate, you would think for a rookie quarterback, one going into an atmosphere that may be louder also than last week. Uh, And with the defense that the Buffalo Bills have, I know the Panthers have really good defense as well, but they may want to lean a little bit on their run game in situations where Davis Mills, they they maybe don't trust him yet or uh, with downs and distances that they just want to use their running backs. Uh, do you think the Texans need more out of their running backs, especially now that they are going on with a rookie quarterback who is still very green in his in his experience so far? Well, Maddie, that will be a function. Well, the, the short answer is yes, uh, that they would want to do that with a young quarterback. The longer answer is that will depend much on their defense. 
because their defense is essentially predictable. It's Lovey Smith. They play a lot of cover two. They play more cover two than any team in the league. They don't generate what you call a consistent pass rush. Yeah. And if the Bills offense is is back as it was one week ago against Washington, they could be in a situation where it's, you know, 17-3 early in the second quarter, and then the run game doesn't become as relevant. So I think the ability to run with some kind of volume will be very much a function of their defense. And personally, I'm not sure they can do much more defensively with the corners that they have. I don't think they can match up to Sanders and Diggs. Um, and I'm not sure they match up to Beasley or McKenzie either. So I think you're going to see Lovey Smith stay pretty much with what he does and hope, hope that that means that the Bills have to try to go 12, 13 plays to score yeah. and maybe make a mistake. But the way the Bills play and the way Brian Dable calls his pass game concepts, I don't think that'll be the case. I think throws will be there. If Josh makes them as he did, on Sunday, they will move the ball and score. Yeah. We talked last week, Greg, about the possibility of Tredavious White following Terry McLaurin a little bit. That did happen last week. Um, yep. You know, Houston, especially with Nico Collins on IR, doesn't really have a tremendous amount behind Cooks. They have Anthony Miller, who's a nice receiver, but beyond him, uh, you know, the depth is limited. So, Lacking, yes. yeah, what do you think is the likelihood of us seeing Tredavious travel again this week, at least to some degree, knowing the Bills' defense at its core is is his own defense? Um, I think he will. He'll line up over. Look, he lined up over McLaurin, and a right. lot of those snaps were zone snaps, as you know, Chris. But I think he will line up over him simply because they don't have much else. And then I think the game – will dictate how much man versus how much zone they play. For instance, this past week, because they got up and were essentially in control of the game, I know it got to be 21-14, but I, I, I mean, to me, I didn't get the feeling that they were in trouble, um, but then they pulled away. I, I think that you'll see them per, perhaps play even more zone, because they do, in normal games, Chris, they do play a decent amount of cover one man coverage. Yep. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's foundational in the sense that that's that's their core methodology but you know everybody thinks of sean mcdermott and leslie frazier playing solely zone that's not really the case uh but i would say they're more predominantly single high than they are split safety but they did play more split safety this week as the game progressed and i believe that was a function of the score you said that you think the Bills have too many weapons or, you know, Emmanuel Sanders and Stefan Diggs is, is going to be a tough matchup for the Texans DBs. Well, one of their good players on defense is, is Christian Kirksey. So how do you think they're going to use his skills at, at the linebacker position to try and limit what this Buffalo Bills offense is capable of doing? Well, Maddie, I mean, the way they play, particularly in the pass game, because, I mean, even though I thought the Bills ran better this week, we know they're not a foundational running team. Um, Kirksey is essentially the middle hole defender in cover two. So, uh, and they don't play cover two, obviously, on every snap, and every team will play man at some point because there's always man down in distance situations like a third and two. But for the most part, he's the middle hole defender when they play cover two. So, Normally what happens with the middle hole defender in cover two is he will open up to what's considered the passing strength or the wide side of the field. And, and more often than not, it's the same side. So he opens up to the wide side of the field. Um, you know, he's, he's a good player. He's always been a solid player. I think he's been a good run defender. I think he's a smart player. Um, I, I know we're looking at highlights of the run game right now with Carolina versus uh, Houston, you know, last week, but this is not really what they're going to face versus uh, Buffalo. And like I said, Buffalo will run the ball somewhat. They're not going to not run it at all. But for the most part, they're going to have to defend the passing game. Going back to, to Buffalo's defense, Greg, they are going to be without Jordan Poyer, who is out yeah. with an ankle injury. Jaquan Johnson, a third-year player, is widely expected to be his replacement in the lineup. How much do you anticipate that impacting 
the ability for those two guys to disguise pre-snap and kind of fool Davis Mills, so to speak, knowing you have a new component in Jaquan Johnson? I think it'll be a factor, and it'll be interesting to see if, if Sean and Leslie do as much of that as they normally do, because those two safeties, particularly working together, are really, really good. Johnson was a player whose tape I watched coming out of Miami. I know he has not really played much in this league right. yeah, with Buffalo, just because they have Poyer and Hyde. Um, I always thought he was an interesting player. I thought he was the kind of guy that, if he was bigger, would have been a higher pick and maybe an NFL starter. I think he's got good traits. He's physical and aggressive. It's just that at his size, he's he's just not really big enough to play that way. Um, but I think you can play him for a week, a couple of weeks. Uh, my guess is he's probably a pretty smart player. That would be my guess. I don't know him, obviously. Um, but I think we'll see. You know, obviously it's a normal week, not a, not a shorter or longer week. I don't. I wouldn't anticipate they do as much early, and then they'll see how the game progresses. Well, Greg, last week we were asking you about Josh Allen's mechanics and maybe what was going wrong the first two weeks for him. And then last week he he has a game that he had last year many times, passing for over 300 yep. yards, uh, four passing touchdowns, one rushing touchdown for him. He was named the AFC Offensive Player of the Week as well. So got back to their old ways, put 43 points on the scoreboard. Why was that performance – why was he able to have success against a Washington defense, uh, the one that we do know now, one that used to be really good last year? And maybe how do you think that success can translate over to the Houston Texans defense? Yeah, I think Josh is the kind of quarterback because much of his game is built on movement, that he walks a fine line, Maddie, between being sort of controlled in his movement and frenetic in his movement. And I thought against Washington, he was very controlled. And actually, it started on the first play of the game when he had to move because of pressure from his front side. He slid, reset his feet. That was what was so impressive to me. Very often when he moves like that, because his arm is so strong, he doesn't reset his feet. But I thought he reset his feet, and he drove the ball with velocity to Davis uh, in between two underneath defenders. And I said to myself, wow, that's that's really good. And then he played in a very controlled way the rest of the game. And even when he did move, and obviously he had to move a, a number of times, he just looked comfortable doing that. So I thought last week obviously was was, as you said, Maddie the Josh Allen of 2020, because you saw the pocket efficiency. You saw the second reaction playmaking. He was much more precise with his ball location. He really didn't miss throws last week. And, you know, taking that a step further on offense, Greg, we saw, I mean, Dawson Knox has put together three pretty good weeks so far this season. He's yeah. never going to be in a situation where he's catching seven or eight balls a week like Travis Kelsey. That's just not his role in this offense. But if he can be what he has been these first three weeks, he quickly becomes another concern for opposing defenses to at least think about, particularly in the red zone. And it's funny you say that because normally he's not really a primary in the way they structure their pass game. But that 14-yard TD, he was the primary, Chris. Yep. That yeah. was the that was your classic one-by-three set where the tight end is the single receiver. They got him matched up on Holcomb. That's where the ball was going. That was the play design. And that was a great back shoulder throw by Allen and a really good leaping catch by Knox. So, you know, again, I agree with you. You're not going to see him start to get eight to ten targets a week. But there may be game situations where they view him as the primary. He's an athletic player. And even down in the red zone where you just mentioned, he's made he's caught some touchdowns where, you know, again, I believe he's the primary. This one I have no doubt about, the one from this week. Others, sometimes I question myself when I watch it, but they, they clearly look to him in the red zone. And kind of like Dawson Knox, another facet of this offense that is not going to be the part of the offense every single play, but it's our running backs, Zach Moss and Devin Singletary. How have they been deployed on offense, uh, and how has it resulted in success through the first three weeks of play here? Well, you know, I think they're starting to, to do some things in the run game, Maddie. And again, they're never going to be a run-first team. They're never going to be a 50-50 ratio of run and pass. But you saw them run the trap game last week. You saw them run what we call wham trap last week. 
Um, so they're starting to do more things. The other thing that I really like that they do is they featured a good mix of no huddle tempo throughout the game. And my sense is that Josh is very comfortable playing that style. So, you know, I think you're going to see the run game not become a volume run game, but become a selective run game in terms of, of how important it is. And if they can run with some kind of efficiency, as they did a week ago, then I think that that's what they want out of their run game. Uh, we also saw, you know, we talked about this last year a lot, Greg, the propensity for the Bills to throw on first down. I mean, they did yeah. more than anybody in the league last year. I think right now they're ranked second in the league behind only Tampa Bay. Um, play action, though, doesn't seem to have become as big a component of their offense through the first three weeks. They've done some of it. Uh, not a tremendous amount, and quite frankly, last week they didn't need to. Everything seemed to be working. So, <laughs> so do you anticipate that it could, you know, reveal itself at some point within the scope of Brian Dable's scheme? If you know, if the given opponent and matchup suits uh, his liking in that area. Yeah, I, I would expect to see a little more play action, and I'm and play action even with Josh under center. I think that that's where play action is its most effective, particularly if you do outside zone uh, run action, because that gets the defensive line moving laterally. And that's what you want. Instead of them rushing the passer vertically, they move laterally. So it would not surprise me to see them do more of that. But you're right. Uh, he has the second most dropbacks on first down behind Tom Brady. We know this is a passing team. So it's just a question of how do you get to your pass game on first down in normal down and distance situations, second and four. How do you want to get to your pass game? Uh, I think that the play action element will increase. And I think the no huddle tempo, as I mentioned, is something that you might see more of too as we go forward. Well, speaking of passing game, we'll move to another team in the NFL. Uh, one game that'll be very interesting uh, this week, and not because of the matchup, but it's because of who could or could not be playing at quarterback. It's the Chicago Bears. Ah. Uh, <laughs> they said they're they're preparing for all three quarterbacks, or or they're going to run through all three depending on health. Who should start for the Bears this weekend? Well, Chris, you know, and Maddie, I'm thinking maybe Sid Luckman's going to start this weekend. Oh, what boy. do you think? Uh, how about I'd take Vince Evans over Sid. There you go. Well, <laughs> you know, all I can do is speak to what I saw last week on tape. You know, we have no idea who's going to start. They probably know the answer to that. They're just not going to announce it. Um, look, they tried to help Fields last week. A lot of quick game. Uh, they tried to get the ball out of his hands. They tried to limit what he had to see and read. And, you know, the thing is, young quarterbacks – all develop at different speeds, different paces. And when a young quarterback struggles, it's not a surprise. It's, it's not as if, oh, my God, when he didn't play great. You know, so at this point in time, Fields does not see things very well. He got locked in on reads. He played both at times too fast, other times too hesitantly. Um, I don't think right now he has an innate sense of what open means at the NFL level. He needs to learn that. But none of this is breaking news to me, guys, just because I've been watching tape for a lot of years. You know, this is not a, an indictment of fields nor predictive of the future. So it's just what he is right now. And if, if he were to continue to play, my guess is he'll get better. Yeah. As good as the Bills have been in scoring, uh, they're mirroring their average from last year, 31.3 a game. Cardinals are scoring more, and so too are the Rams. Um, yes. Rams' high-efficiency scorers, over 58% of their drives result in points. And as we know, the Cardinals lead the league, and they're second in total yards on offense. So what has maybe impressed you the most about each of those two offenses? Because they look like they both have staying power going forward. Well, what, I'll start with Murray. What, what's really interested me about Kyler Murray this year is – He's become much better with his ball placement, ball location on uh, throws from the pocket. We know what he is as a dynamic playmaker, but he needed to become more consistent making the throws that are there from the pocket. And that has stood out uh, this year. So that's that's obviously critical. Um, this, as far as the Rams, one thing that's really stood out on tape is their increased use of empty sets. 
And I think that's that's probably because of Stafford, because what empty sets do is it gives you tendency predictability of coverage. And Stafford's been playing a long time. There's probably not much that he hasn't seen. So you you're giving him so much more information before the snap of the ball. And they're, they're a difficult team to match up to. Well, one game that I'll have an eye on, and I think other people will, is the Eagles-Chiefs game. Not because of the fact that it might be the best matchup, but because of the fact that the Bills play the Chiefs here coming up in week five. And the Eagles have a decent running back in Miles Sanders. And if that's the key to beat the Chiefs, then the Bills have got to get their run game together for week five. But would you say that's the best chance that the Eagles have to beat the Chiefs is to to use Miles Sanders in, in ways that maybe they haven't before? Well, the haven't before part is true since its first carry last week came in their fourth possession. <laughs> um, you know, I have I have some feelings about the Eagles offense. You know, I always when I talk about this based on my point of view, I never want to rip coaches. I know how hard they work, but part of me thinks that they should line up Jalen Hurts under center, start their offense with the run game um, in some ways, the way the Cowboys did with Dak Prescott in his first year uh, when they had Zeke, when they had a good all line and the run game was the foundation and you work the pass game concepts off of that. Uh, the Eagles have two good running backs. Sanders can be very good. And Kenneth Gainwell is a very good player. Now, I don't know. I, Sanders is not Zeke in terms of volume carries, but with those two backs, I think you could still have a volume run game. Uh, but I'm just, I'm curious. And, and you know, the other thing, the most surprising thing to me of week three in the league la last week was how much man-to-man -man coverage the Chargers played against the Chiefs. The Eagles won't do that. They're a wholly zone-based team. But the Chargers against the Chiefs played about 80% man coverage and wow. most people would say you do not do that against the Chiefs. And they did it, and they beat them. Pretty impressive. Um, Teddy Bridgewater looks like he's been a settling influence on yes. that Broncos offense. I mean, he might not be spectacular, but he's consistent. And I know, because I'm ready for all the people to say, well, they've, the three teams have a combined one victory, so that's why they're 3-0. and But you can't blame the Broncos for who's on their schedule. So... What what do you see there? Because they've been without Judy in the lineup. Now they've lost Hamler. Do we expect this offense to stub its toe now a little bit based on the level of competition they're going to be facing going forward, which gets stiffer, and the fact that they're a little bit shorthanded now in terms of personnel? Well, they're a little – in the way the game is played today, Chris, they'd be considered old school. They want to run the football. They've got two good backs in the rookie Williams and Melvin Gordon. They've got a very good defense. Vic Fangio is a savant. He's one of the best there is coaching defense in this league and has been doing it a long time. And they play with a quarterback that's efficient, does not turn the ball over, does not make mental mistakes. And every once in a while, they create a shot play down the field based on the anticipated coverage. So that's the way they're playing, and that fits what they have right now. That's not going to change. Now, I, uh, they're not going to go 17-0, and 0, but I think they're a solid football team. Now, they could certainly lose any given week because they're not likely to put up 30-35 just in the normal course of events. But I think they're really solid. I think they're well-coached. They're efficient. And if you don't turn the ball over, and Bridgewater has never really been a guy who's turned it over, then you can live with the fact that he's not really a guy who's going to drive it down the field consistently. And on the flip side of that, I mean, the Broncos have an injured defense, so could this be a game where certain weapons on the Ravens have, have a breakout game? Well, I guess we'll find out. I mean, they say Lamar Jackson's going to play, right? Isn't that pretty much what's being yeah, put out there? Yeah, practice today, right. Right, so... I, I got to tell you, I think the Ravens coaching staff has done a really good job because I think they wanted to do this last year, but COVID prevented them. I think they've expanded some of the things they're doing in the past game. I think they're helping Jackson a lot with more defined reads and throws. I think he's throwing the ball well. Um, I think they've done more with their past game. And now uh, I don't believe Bateman is quite ready for this week, but he's coming back. I know Miles Boykin is coming back. They're going to have their full allotment of receivers, and I'm very anxious to see them going forward. We know about their run game, but I think their pass game, they've started to expand, and I'm very curious to see where they go with it. 
All right, Greg, thanks very much for uh, all the insight, not just with this matchup with the Texans, but around the league as well. We'll uh, keep an eye out for you on the NFL matchup show this weekend. Take care. We'll see you next week. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks.